so Scandi, I, I I just walked by. This is really cool. What is, what am I looking at here? Because this is obviously it's a 3D printer or a 3D printing convention, 3D printer. Yeah. But we're printing silicone. We are printing yes. platinum cure silicone. So okay, and it's in a gel. So it's in a hydrogel, and the purpose of the hydrogel is to actually keep that silicone that we're putting in the gel in place. And hence our tagline, gravity-free manufacturing. So you're you're not needing any support material at all, Absolutely obviously. No this. support material. You're actually just printing the part that you need without the extra waste. So what the, the gel itself, it's inert, I'm assuming. So you when it's the print done, you just kind of reach it and grab it or correct. So it's a water-based suspension system. So you can reach in with your hands, grab the part out, out of the gel and you just wash it with water because it's drain safe. So it, it comes out of the machine like done, cured? Completely cured, there's no post-processing -process well, involved at all. The surface quality, all the properties that you get out of the print is from the printing process itself. Oh wow, because you, you have some, I'll do some B-roll shots of closer up. There's like, you don't really see layer lines Correct. on these yeah. prints. Because our process is really allowing the layers to blend into each other. So you're not waiting for one layer to cure before you go to the next one. It allows the material to actually flow into itself and become a really isotropic surface. So it's basically like one homogenous part top to bottom. And you, don't, exactly. you, don't, you don't have like the layer line delamination issues. Correct, right? and you don't deal with delamination or failure issues because of that. Oh, wow. So I'm looking at it being like laid down, printed, however the, the process is described. It does seem to be moving a little bit, but is that just kind of like an elastic, it springs back kind of that's thing? That's kind of the property of the gel, and obviously okay. it moves with the movement, but it doesn't actually displace the material that's being deposited. This is really cool. So this is a silicone. Are there any other plastics or materials that you can print on a machine like this? Yes, you can. Uh, commercially, we're doing silicone, but we have shown the capability of doing like polyurethanes, other foams in the past, but commercially, we're only doing silicone. Okay, and, and what's like a big use case for a machine like this? Yeah, absolutely. One of our main applications are within the medical field. So we've done a lot of prosthetics and orthotics for amputees who are looking for a custom solution. And then now we're kind of growing into more industrial applications like gaskets. Yeah, I've seen quite seals. a few gaskets because yeah. this is pretty cool because you don't need a you don't need a tool to make the gasket. So if you only need like a one off custom thing or yeah. out of production model, we can as long as you process. have the CAD file, you're good to go. Exactly. And obviously we're reducing the amount of waste that you're creating by needing a mold. So with our process, we could scale it up and down to create a full big print, a meter scale print completely continuously. And this is moving pretty fast. So we, we could see the, the specs over there, but it, this seems to be a pretty, pretty fast process, correct? Correct, yeah. Most of our parts we try to do it under an hour. Um, and obviously for larger pieces, you will see, we like to promote and show all the printing time of our pieces because it is that fast. Now, is there like a specific nozzle size this machine uses or can it swap out or? Technically, you can swap it out. For us, we're keeping the same nozzle for everything. And the way that you can change thickness is actually by changing speed and pressure of the printing time. Because the material also blends together too. So exactly. you don't have to worry about that. Yeah. That is a really cool process. Now, is this um, an example of the machine or is this a trade show demo machine or like is this how big the machine is this normally? is this is our first release of the machine so this is kind of our so it's uh, a brand new product flagship is, oh nice new product that we're showing here at rapid very this nice lighting by the way big, very nice lighting this is our standard uh, we like to call it the RLP gel TV in the back so um, this is becoming available now to the market so that customers can take gravity free manufacturing into their own factories this is really cool and where can people find more information about this? Absolutely. You can go to rapidliquidprint.com to learn about our service bureau, but also about the machine now that's it's available to purchase Levity. Awesome. Well, thank you very much for that. Thank you for your time. Cheers. Okay, so we're here with Darren from Manifest Technologies, and they have something really cool here because nothing's more annoying with resin than having to clean supports off and, and all that stuff. So. What if you just skip supports? Yeah, great you, question. For conventional layer by layer 3D printing, you have layers, you have support structures that you have to clean off. That's not part of the target geometry, right? For us, that's not the case. We are fabricating all these awesome parts in one single step, and it's all volumetric. We basically raster a cone of light onto a, a photo cure bar resin, and we're able to actually build that volume in 3D. So forget about support structures. 
if you take a look at those like uh, TPMS structures, if you print those in your conventional 3D printers, it will be a pain in the ass to take out the support structures, right? We don't have that problem. As you can see from this little cartridge, this is something that we just printed, right? These are all done in 3D. You don't have support structure, you don't have anything. You, it's all in there. Take a closer look. So Let's those are just kind of are. floating in resin there. They're, they're completely unsupported. They're completely unsupported. That's the tricky, that's the, that's the neat part about that. So how are you doing this? It, it, you have a cone of light. Is, right. is it where the light, where the light inter, intersects? That's is that how it cures? Question. Yes. So, Imagine these are the cone of lights, and okay. we're basically projecting a 2D image throughout a, some optics so that come out as cones. So it's, imagine these are the beamlets. I project those five beamlets into the resin this way, and I move my beamlets over here, and then I project again. So these overlaps actually have the double the optical dose, right? So that's where things will solidify. Everything else remains as liquid. So that really gave us an unmatched opportunity to fabricate things in 3D with like dimensional control and everything. And that's the neat thing about this, this is volumetric. So, so that's really cool. So what sort of, so this is, this is a pretty big machine with a pretty small print volume, but like, are there limitations to how like deep into the resin you that's can go? That's a great or? question. We are unlimited in X, Y. So you can think about a tank of resin and we can just raster the tool head around it and you can print as big as you want in X and Y. Uh, what about Z? How deep can you go currently? Deep? That's a, also a great question. Because light attenuates, uh, that's a little jargon. That means like light actually dies down a little bit yep. as you go down. I mean, look, think about think about like looking down into the ocean, right? Yeah. Deep down in the ocean, you don't really see much light. That's the same case here. However, right now we only have one two-head. You can imagine having two, like double two-heads and they'll double the penetration depth. So, so they would be able to go through glass, right? You can have yes. a glass bottom, We have glass bottoms, yes. You're on point. <laughs> yeah, so um, the vision that we have is, right now we have a lab valuation module that has one tool-head inside it. But honestly, you don't really need a printer. Forget about printers. We can really take the tool head, put it in any scenario that you have, factories or you whatever. You can just mount it to any motion system mount that would fit system. your use case. Exactly. Oh. As long as you have a target geometry in mind, you have a resin or you have a property that you are shooting for, give us all those information. We can put all those in our software. The software will figure out how we use the light cone, what images are projecting, and then we'll make it happen for you. So essentially, so you have the light coming down. Is there any light coming in from the side at all, or it's just straight There's down? No, no, this is all straight down, but as a cone, right? The angular information is okay. inside the cone. So we're really coupling the angles with the X, Y translational motions, and that's how we gain 3D depth control. And what kind of resin is it? Is it just like a generic clear resin or is it a specialty no. resin? No, this is not a specialty. We're actually partnered with Arkema and this is just like one of their off the shelf 3D printing resin that can be used in your conventional DLP printers. Uh, we simply just give them some, they give us something that we wanted to test on. As long as it's transparent to blue light and it has okay. the correct photo initiator in it, so you, you, you could play around with colors, but it would still have to be translucent to blue light, yes. essentially. Okay. And what kind of dimensional accuracy are you getting out of this system? Great. That's also a great question. So theoretically, we can go down to as long as as low as 50 microns right now. Uh, the part that we're printing today is about 150 microns in details. But yeah, because we have we some are, examples here. We have some examples here, and we have some like actual data in here as well. Uh, this is a little one sheet. And we, we are looking to go to like um, single microns in the future. Okay. And of course, once it comes out of here, it's still in a semi-cured state, so you are gonna have to go through an additional post curing, curing process. I actually did, I did give a talk earlier at Rapid TCT about post-curing, we figured it out. So all this, like from having the STL, put that in the software to figure out things out, to fabricating that inside resin to post-curing, post-curing, we figure it out. We have all those in control. So, yeah, we're, we are trying to, we're depicting our like uh, evaluation module right now, yep. just so that people can put those yeah, into their actual use cases so they can give us some feedback. And you have so, a little time lapse here. So it, it actually moves pretty quick. So it's doing, it looks like, a, that's a full size like dental. That is a full size dental aligner. And you can find that on our website too, uh, or on our actual YouTube channel. And that is just me printing an aligner. This is yeah. eight sped up, but the entire uh, process took about four minutes. Which is pretty quick. Which is pretty quick. And again, you know you still have to go through an additional curing process. Right. There's no supports to clean up. There's no supports it's to clean ready up. ready to go right yes. out of the machine pretty yeah. much. 
That we is... actually have also developed a uh, post curing, post curing, or post processing unit that we didn't bring it here because we didn't want to make a mess. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that's also something that we are interested to launch to um, any folks, either in the volumetric space or any resin based people. Right. So that's really cool. Yeah. And people can find more information at manifesttechnologies.com or yeah, just yeah. Google it. Manifest manifest technologies manifest dot tech. Okay. Yeah. So <laughs> shoot us an email or just um, contact us and if you're interested, let us know. Yeah, this is this is really cool. It is always cool to see new tech at events like this. So yeah. Cheers Darren. All right, cheers man. I'm here with Isaac from Oregon State University, and they're working on five axis 3D printing, but they're doing the thing that nobody wants to do, which is the thing that keeps it from being usable and practical for a lot of people, the software side of things. So what have you got here? Yes, so we have a couple different uh, projects going on, but it all centers around this non-planar slicer project that we have uh, within our lab. So that we have started from scratch. We kind of realized that if you're gonna go non-planar, a lot of the algorithms that you find within those slicer softwares that you can just download are, are not really applicable. So we have some projects that are working on planar. So we have some infill patterns over there. Um, that one is a stiffness optimized infill. So if you tell the computer how you're going to use your part, you can get a little bit more performance out of the interior structure. So it's basically like an FEA for the infill. So you're optimizing density of infill for locations that need it yes. the most essentially. Yes, so this one's the most intuitive where it's a, it's a three point bending. So you're gonna hold it in the corners and then push down in the top of the middle. Um, and you can see kind of making an arch uh, over. And all of these were printed on, on your standard hobbyist. It's an Ender 3 from 2020. And the uh, thing is though, the software is doing all that for you. Yes, so I, uh, I wrote the path generation and the simulation and the optimization loop within that. So it's all software that we've written in-house. Another one of the infill patterns that we've made is this. Uh, so this uh, model of uh, half of a rabbit was printed with no retractions whatsoever. So as you can see with this little uh, little puck, that's one layer and it's all one continuous path. So once it uh, you can have multiple perimeters and infill with a vase mode like surface finish. Oh, very nice. So just one continuous. So that would be good if uh, like somebody tried to do continuous carbon fiber. Yes, so that is one of the interests in our in our lab. Um, we're, we're trying to move over there once we've gotten the, the path generation working. And one of the things that we've uh, shown is this, uh, with this printer, we're mostly printing PLA uh, and it's plastics, but because this is all paths for deposition-based manufacturing, you could use this with something like a powder DED uh, or a wire welder or other, other things that is just a tool head tracing out a path. Okay. Um, and one of the big things that we're working on is non-planar slicing. So we have the, there's this class of surfaces in uh, math called quadrics, um, but it's a it's a large class of surface that can get you a, a, a big variety while maintaining the same, I guess, mathematical fundamentals. So these are uh, kind of a, a, key, a square bending up along a, an arc. So these layers have variable layer height within the same layer. So along the outside of that cube, you're gonna see a lot more layer uh, material being deposited than along the inside. Interesting. And then we have some, some models on curved surfaces. So this uh, demo, uh, the model eventually becomes a uh, knight, like a chess piece. And so it curves up like this so you can print the head of the knight without any support material whatsoever. Excellent. And that's, that's one of the big benefits of the non-planers. You can get uh, no support material, so easy printability. You can break up those layer lines for, for a strength advantage. And then you can also print over the entire uh, part, of, part of the model or the entire skin of the model to get a really good surface finish, uh, avoid that stair stepping. Excellent. So hopefully, like, because that's been the biggest problem holding back 5-axis 3D printing, at least at the oh, consumer absolutely. level. Because 5-axis has been around for decades with CNC. It's just, there's no real slicers or real turnkey easy solution for an at-home user to use a 5-axis system on a traditional 3D printer right now. So hopefully I, one day the software gets there. <laughs> hopefully. And I think one of, the, one of the things you see in CNC is there's a lot, people are used to a lot more manual toolpath planning. Uh, like even a 5-axis CNC, yeah. programming that is very intensive, whereas with our additive softwares, we're not used to having to manually drag those toolpaths around. You click button and it goes. Throw the so. benchy on the plate, hit slice, and off you go, and maybe adjust a Exactly, settings. and once we can get there, I think it's gonna, it's gonna be a lot easier and more justifiable for established companies to build these 5-axis machines, because they don't wanna have to put the money and build an entire slicing package, but once it's there, I think you'll see a lot more machines on the market. Excellent.
Excellent. And where can people learn about the stuff you're working on? Is yeah, so we have a website. Um, uh, it, it's on one of these QR codes if you want to try and find it in the description. One of these QR codes can get to the rest of them. Uh, but Oregon State in general, we're with the design engineering lab um, in the me mechanical engineering department. So we're, we're actually all mechanical engineers, but okay. we, we're programming all this. Well, cool. So hopefully one day, you know, we will be able to throw a Benchy on a five axis 3D oh, printer. Hopefully. That's the and goal. it'll just work. So yes. one day. Cheers. <laughs>